This is a revision video going over the key facts from the specification for AQA A-level chemistry for the group 7 or 17 halogens topic within inorganic chemistry. There's a link in the description below to the questions so that you can go through and have a go at answering them and then use this video to check that you fully understood everything from the spec that you need to recall. Group 7 are also known as the halogens and the salts that they make are known as the halides. When chlorine is an element, then it's a pale green gas. Bromine is a red-brown liquid and iodine is a grey-black solid, although you may also be aware that when it's not in its standard state, if it's ever so slightly warmed, then it does start producing these beautiful violet-purple vapours. But that's not its standard state because at room temperature it is a solid. Then when each of these dissolves in water, chloride ions in water, what we call chlorine water, just looks very, very pale green. But for bromine and iodine, we see an orange solution. Electronegativity can be defined as the power of an atom to pull towards it the pair of electrons in a covalent bond. And as you go down group seven, the elements become less electronegative. And this is why fluorine is the most reactive. And as we go down, the reactivity decreases because they become less electronegative. In the group seven elements, we see simple molecules, and these have two atoms in them, so they're sometimes called divalent and they're sometimes called diatomic. These molecules have van der Waals forces between them, and as you go down group seven, the melting points and the boiling points increase because the strength of those van der Waals forces increases. This is happening because the molecules are increasing in size and they each have more electrons. And therefore, we have these stronger van der Waals forces, and therefore, they require more energy to overcome. Oxidising ability is the ability to oxidise something else. And oxidation, of course, is losing electrons. So when we say what's the oxidising ability, we mean how good at stealing another atom's electrons is this particular atom. So the best oxidising agent in group seven is fluorine. And as you go down the group, um, the oxidising ability gets less and less. The reason for this is that fluorine has the smallest atoms. And this means that the outer shell electrons and any electron that fluorine is in the process of taking from another atom are closer to the nucleus than if we look at, say, chlorine or bromine or iodine or acetine. And also because it's a small atom, because it has fewer shells, those shells are providing shielding. And so the fact that fluorine has fewer shells means that um, there is less shielding from the electrostatic attraction of the nucleus to those electrons that are being taken from another atom. For this displacement reaction, you could have picked any pair of elements from group seven. Um, but the important thing is that um, the more reactive displaces the less reactive. So in this example here, fluorine is the more reactive element. Therefore, that's the one in its elemental form. And um, the chlorine is starting off as chloride ions, maybe in potassium chloride or sodium chloride. And because the fluorine is more reactive and it can displace the chloride ions, then at the end of the reaction, we have molecular chlorine and the fluoride ions are now present instead. We've already said that oxidising ability is the ability of an atom to oxidise something else. So, of course, reducing ability is the ability of an atom to reduce something else. And reduction is the gain of electrons. So, in other words, how good are these ions at giving away their electrons um, and themselves being oxidised so that something else is reduced? And as we go down group seven, reducing ability increases. So iodide ions are better at reducing than bromide ions, which are better than chloride ions, which are better than fluoride ions, which are frankly not very good at all. Again, this is going to come down to the size of the atoms and the number of shells and therefore the forces that are being experienced. So the iodide ion is the, the largest of those four that I've mentioned, um, and that means it can lose an outer shell electron more easily because that electron is further from the nucleus and therefore it's experiencing less electrostatic attraction and the electrostatic attraction that it is experiencing is better shielded by those inner shells. For these next reactions, you need to be aware that we're talking about the solid halide salts and then concentrated sulfuric acid. And for the sodium chloride, there's just one equation to remember, but for sodium bromide and sodium iodide, you need to know both the initial equation and then also what happens subsequently. So to start with sodium chloride, we just have one equation to worry about. When sodium chloride reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid, we make sodium hydrogen sulfate and also hydrogen chloride. And we see that as these steamy fumes. 
And this is the one reaction that isn't a redox reaction. We're not going to see any change in oxidation states because the chloride ion is too weak of a reducing agent. But as we go down the group, down group seven, um, things become better reducing agents and then we do start to see redox reactions occurring. Then, as we say for sodium bromide, we're going to have two reactions. So in our initial reaction, it's very similar to the reaction with sodium chloride. We see the sodium bromide reacting with the sulfuric acid. And again, we make sodium hydrogen sulfate and we make hydrogen bromide, which has, again, these steamy fumes. It looks quite similar to hydrogen chloride. But the thing is that that hydrogen bromide, of course, contains bromide ions. And those bromide ions are a better reducing agent than the chloride ions were. So unlike the chloride ions, they can reduce the sulfur in the sulfuric acid. So we have this second reaction where we're then producing sulfur dioxide and also bromine, which you'll see as these sort of brown fumes being produced. So that's our second one. And then likewise for sodium iodide, we also have two reactions. So initially, again, we produce sodium hydrogen sulfate and, uh, and here we have hydrogen iodide. Um, but then also we then have those iodide ions reducing the sulfur in the um, sulfuric acid. And this time around, we produce hydrogen sulfide, which of course smells terrible, um, and also water and also some iodine being produced. And you'll be able to see that iodine being produced as well. To test for the presence of halide ions, we use silver nitrate, which is going to form these various precipitates. But before we can add that silver nitrate, we need to add some acid in order to remove the presence of carbonates or sulfates, which would give us a false positive. Um, and usually because silver nitrate contains nitrate ions already, we use nitric acid. So you add the two of those and you're then looking for these different precipitates. So if you have chloride ions, you get a white precipitate. If you have bromide ions, you have a cream precipitate. And if you have iodide ions, you have a yellow precipitate. Now, what's actually going on here is that the silver ions are joining up with the halide ions that are already present to form a silver halide. And those silver halides are insoluble, so therefore they precipitate out. So for instance, we could have these aqueous silver ions and these aqueous chloride ions forming solid silver chloride. And you would go through exactly the same process if it was bromide ions or iodide ions, the equations are the same, just with the relevant halide ion in there. We can't use this test to identify fluoride ions because silver fluoride won't precipitate out because it's actually soluble. There are two sets of equations that you need to know for the reactions between chlorine and water. So firstly, we just have chlorine reacting with water to form hydrogen chlorate and hydrogen chloride. But then also, if this reaction happens in sunlight, then instead we get two chlorines and two waters reacting to form four lots of hydrogen chloride and also oxygen gas. When chlorine reacts with cold dilute sodium hydroxide, then it forms sodium chlorate, which is this oxidizing agent and is what you find in bleach. But we also produce sodium chloride and also water. Now, you might be wondering why this last question is in here, because obviously this has nothing to do with halogens or halides, but it's because the anion required practical is part of this section of the specification. So even though um, none of these things are in group seven, they come up in the same part because we're talking about how to detect halide ions and then how to also detect these other kinds of ions. So hydroxide ions are obviously what we find in alkalis, and so we can test for their presence using indicators. Although in order to do that, we're probably going to need them to be a solution. So you might want to talk about adding a little bit of water if they've given you a solid compound to begin with. So there isn't a named example of an indicator, but you could talk about universal indicator, which turns blue, or litmus, which turns blue, or phenolphthalein, which turns pink, or even methyl orange, which turns yellow, or really just any relevant example of an indicator. Um, then for our carbonate ions, they're going to be tested for by adding an acid. Um, you probably want to name an appropriate acid, um, depending on what other tests you're going to be doing around it. Um, you obviously need to be aware that if you're going to be doing halide testing, for instance, you couldn't add hydrochloric acid and then go on to do that halide test. You'd need to do the halide test first or use a different acid. Um, but when you add that acid, you're going to see effervescence or in other words, you're going to see it bubbling. Um, and then for your sulfate ions, of course, we test for sulfate ions by adding barium chloride. And when we do that, we get a white precipitate, 
which is barium sulfate, the same stuff that they use for a barium meal. And you've learned about that as part of the group two topic. But crucially, before you can add that barium chloride, you need to add some acid in order to get rid of any carbonates because they would give you a false positive. Um, so we tend to um, add nitric acid or hydrochloric acid. You obviously can't add sulfuric acid because if you did that, you would be adding sulfate ions. And then, of course, you would get a positive test for sulfate ions because you've just put them in. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found that a useful contribution to your revision for A-level chemistry. If there's a particular topic you want me to cover then don't forget to let me know in the comments below and if you are finding this useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry videos coming soon.